Locked On Vikings and Locked On Commanders crossing over here on your Crossover Thursday episode, brought to you by Prize Picks, right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Vikings, Commanders, the battle of two teams with uh, revenge games at quarterback. (laughs) Welcome to Crossover Thursday. Hello, Vikings fans. Hello, Commanders fans. It's Crossover Thursday. That means Locked On Vikings and Locked On Commanders collabing on this Thursday episode, previewing the upcoming game, Vikings at Commanders. I I would be remiss if I did not mention this is Kirk Cousins' first time back in Washington since leaving the Commanders, which is actually kind of weird. It's been like five years, but I guess we Mm -hmm. just never played a road game over there. It's always been a different NFC East team. Uh, One game against the Commanders at U.S. Bank, but also this is Taylor Heineke's first game against the Minnesota Vikings, I believe, right? So that's also a bit of a, a story. The Vikings let him go way back in 2016, sort of lived to regret it as he became, at the very least, a solid backup quarterback. It's been a problem for the Vikings. So I, I guess let's start with that. How do you feel about this quarterback matchup as somebody who covered Kirk Cousins for so many years and is now covering mm-hmm. Taylor Heineke. Yeah, Luke, good to be with you. First off, um, you know, I, I, I did cover Kirk Cousins from the minute he walked in the door here in 2012, and I got to know Kirk uh, very well, and 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 we still stay in contact. And uh, I know he's very much looking forward uh, to reliving some fond memories uh, that he had, as he told me uh, earlier this week, uh, of of returning to FedEx. And like you said, he's already faced the organization once. I believe that was back in 2019, 2019. On Thursday. Thursday night. Yeah, right. Thursday night football. He didn't play particularly well in that game. Uh, so, you know, maybe some of that, you know, got it out of his system. But you're right. This is his first time at FedEx Field uh, since the end of the 2017 season. And certainly it did not end well. Uh, the last couple of years were uh, constant angst around here uh, because of the contract. And we could revisit all that. You, you know, I would take like another couple of episodes to revisit that. I mean, clearly <laughs> he's moved on. The commanders really have not ever been able to find a sustainable replacement for him. You mentioned Taylor Heineke. Clearly Heineke is the starting quarterback for the Washington commanders for this game. And for now moving forward in replace of the injured Carson Wentz. And quite honestly, we may have seen Heineke in this game anyway, because Wentz was struggling so much even yeah. before the injury. Uh, Luke, what, what Heineke brings is different than what Kirk Cousins brings. Of course, Kirk Cousins is a throw on schedule, throw on platform, throw, um, you know, by design type yeah. quarterback, as you know. I Taylor know. Heineke is pretty much the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah. you know? I mean, he is at his best when he is improvising, when he is off platform, off schedule. That doesn't mean he can't throw from the pocket, but he does struggle for long stretches from the pocket in a traditional offense where they are trying not to boot him, waggle him, sprint him, have him dart all over the place and have him basically be Houdini. So it's a really interesting contrast of styles between the two quarterbacks. But quite honestly, even though the commanders haven't scored a lot of points in the last two weeks, 23 against Mm -hmm. Green Bay and 17 against um, the um, The uh, Yeah, the Colts, excuse me, sorry. Uh, Even though they haven't scored a lot of points, you know, the offense has been at times more productive and looked more interesting, let's call it that way, under Taylor Heineke than it did under Carson Wentz. Yeah, when I saw the news that Carson Wentz was going to be out for a while and it would be Heineke, my first thought was, darn, I would rather go against Wentz, I think. Right. Um, it has been a weird journey of quarterbacks since uh, Case Keenum uh, through Dwayne Haskins and, and all of the, the weird other things that have happened to uh, to Washington. I would be remiss if I didn't quick ask you about all of the business side stuff that's going on. Uh, yet another federal investigation. By my count, that's number three going on right now for the commanders. Uh, and I've, I lost count a long time ago. <laughs> So the 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 feds are all up in the commander's business 
and Dan Snyder maybe looking to sell the team now and all that stuff. I, I don't need you to get into all of that. Mm-hmm. I can just direct my listeners, listen to Locked On Commanders for, for all of what you need to know on that. Um, but what I would ask is, does this have any effect on the players or is this like when you see stock price news and you work at Walmart and you're a greeter and it's like, well, that doesn't change anything for me. Yeah. It's a, it's a fascinating question. And, and, and yes, we have, you know, of course, full coverage uh, at at locked on commanders, but um, I don't believe that this directly affects the players. They were asked about it on Wednesday. They've been asked about it over the last couple of weeks. They were asked about it from time to time. And all of them say, listen, you can't ignore, or you can't, yeah, you can't ignore the outside noise, but we have one job. We control this. We have no control over that. Honestly, in many cases, most of the players don't even know who Dan Snyder personally, right? I'm sure mm-hmm. yeah, like he knows Terry McLaurin and he knows Jonathan Allen and he might know Taylor Heineke and Carson Wentz, but he doesn't have any any direct dealings with the players by and large like it used to be. Uh, around here. And so from that respect, I don't really think they know anything other than that's the man who signs my paycheck. Um, Mm -hmm. Again, the only time that they probably think about it is when they're asked about it. Uh, And maybe I'm sure in their personal lives, Hey, what's going on with Dan? You know, what, like, is he going to sell the team? And they're probably like, I don't know. I don't care. I mean, you know, you know how football players are. They come right there in their world. Exactly. Ron Rivera. I do think, all of the chaos, all of the controversy over the last couple of years, uh, I, I not only think, I know it has ta- it has drained him to no end uh, between everything that he's been dealing with, um, you know, on a personal level and a professional level. I know that it is taken its toll on Ron Rivera. How could it not? But in terms of the actual players, I don't think so. I, I do wonder this, though. Uh, Sunday, when Kirk and the Vikings come in to – FedEx field, like you mentioned for the first time that he uh, has been with and Kevin O'Connell, the head coach obviously was the offensive coordinator here until the end of the 2019 season. And uh, Ben Kotwika, who's on their staff and um, you know, and Wes Phillips were all, you know, here during many years of chaos mm-hmm. and, and consternation. So they're all used to uh, kind of things. They're going to be wearing their black uniforms, the commanders, and they're going to be having what's called a blackout. You know, you've seen oh, cool. that at Penn state, like with the whiteout. So we used to do that uh, in high school. Yeah, we, we, well, that is, sometimes that's that that's what it reminds you of around here. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's fun. sometimes a Mickey Mouse operation. Uh, but but <laughs> the reason why the reason why I bring that up is because with the news of Dan Snyder possibly and potentially selling, I think it will galvanize the fan base between what they're trying to do from a marketing perspective and just that elation and that joy and that relief that mm. a lot of Commanders fans are feeling right now. I think it might add to a more home field atmosphere than they hmm. normally have, which is to say virtually none. I was going to say like Vikings fans travel pretty well. They've, yeah. they've, we've heard a lot of skull chants at road games mm-hmm. in the last couple of years, but maybe if the, yeah, if there's uh, all that galvanization, it, it is interesting. You know, the Kevin O'Connell was asked about like, Hey, you're going back to like, you played with Kirk. You were coached Kirk Cousins a few years ago in, in that stadium. You know, what was that like? And and he kind of waxed poetic about how much he saw Kirk Cousins grow in that 2017 season. Um, and I guess that is the, one of the key stories of this one, other of this season for the Vikings outside of, are they for real? Which you're always going to ask when they're beating teams by one score and all that. But the, growth of Kirk Cousins under Kevin O'Connell has always been like, can he do that? When O'Connell came in, interviewed for the job, the head coaching job, his pitch was, I can fix Kirk Cousins. Mm -hmm. I can get him to um, push the ball down the field more. I can get him to play more aggressively. I can get him to uh, be more situationally aware. One of his big things has been situational masters. We want to have everybody aware of exactly where the sticks are, what third downs mean, what happens when the clock is different. Everybody needs to be super aware and really good at it. Um, and I think that that'll help you a lot, especially in close games. Um, you know, when to keep him in bounds, when to make sure he gets out of bounds, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and that was a big blind spot for Kirk Cousins, that situational adaptation where his his progression would need to change when it's in a two-minute drill. You don't have any timeouts and you can't throw to the sideline. 
Um, or you can't throw in the middle. He would still throw to the middle and then they would, you know, the clock would run out as they're trying to spike the ball. And you're like, Kirk, what are you doing? (laughs) Um, That relationship, considering the contrast between the relationship between Mike Zimmer and Kirk Cousins, who just fired and they they didn't even talk. Those two guys have, have a relationship that appears to be paying dividends. And I guess that's the biggest story of, of the Vikings for how they got to six and one to this point. Um, but it's a long season, and, and they're definitely aware of that. They're also not like super thrilled with how they've played so far. I think they understand that there's a lot of improvement to be made. But I think we can talk about some individual players and, and matchups and stuff. There's some that I want to ask you about, especially on the outside there. Uh, but first, let me talk to you about Blue Nile. Blue Nile is uh, where you can go to get that perfect gift for that special someone whether it's an engagement or an anniversary, or you just want to do something nice, Blue Nile has 24-7 online experts that are there to help you make sure you're getting the right thing. Like, do you know what a princess cut is? If not, you might need a little help. And that is what Blue Nile can do for you. So make your moment sparkle with Blue Nile. Go to BlueNile.com and enter code Locked On to save $50 on your purchase of $500 or more. That's B-L-U-E-N-I-L-E.com, code Locked On to save $50 on your purchase of $500 or more. BlueNile.com, code Locked On. This episode is also, of course, as all Crossover Thursdays are, brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Just pick your favorite two to five players, whether they will do better than their prize picks projection or not. And if you're right, you can win up to 10 times your money and you can get a 100% deposit match up to hundred bucks. Again, to promo code locked on at prizepicks.com or on the prize picks app. Thanks again for making crossover Thursday, your first listen of the day each and every day. Make sure you check out locked on sports today as well. I'm sure Peter will have some thoughts on the goings on with the Washington commanders as well. Um, he he may but, have a special he may have a special guest or uh, or two. Uh, in, in is that, that a is that a tease? Uh, it's, it's a tease. I, I mean, if you need there more you of me in your life, if you need more Dan Snyder, if you need more of me in your life, there's one place to go. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, so let me ask you this. Let's let's focus on what's on the field. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the most important matchup here? I, I have my thought for that, but I'm curious to see where where do you think this game gets decided. Yeah. So, uh, you know, look, I, I I could go a couple of different ways, but for me, I'm going to go with can Zedarius Smith, who's been so good for the Minnesota Vikings mm-hmm. as a free agent addition. Can he generate enough pressure, enough heat against a very inconsistent offensive line? And I think he can to really affect the passing game and as well, the running game of the Washington commanders, but specifically the passing game of Taylor Heineke, who, yes, does have mobility and does have the ability to dance and dart, move around and extend plays and buy time that Carson Wentz did not. But Zedarius Smith can also just, you know, kind of railroad a a plan, if you Mm -hmm. will, to have a normal, efficient passing game, meaning an on-script passing game. Again, what the commanders like to do is they like to operate with Taylor Heineke, especially in the first half, but almost until they have like this desperate need, they like to be on schedule. They like to be normal. They like to be or try to establish rhythm from the pocket. And it doesn't always work. As a matter of fact, it often fails. And it did, you know, in, in each of the last couple of games Uh, and Taylor Heineke is going to throw your, one or two bad passes a game that get, uh, you know, potentially, uh, you know, are, are up for grabs and 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 sometimes have been intercepted as he has in each of the last two games. Had a pick six against Green Bay. Uh, had a interception deep in Washington territory that turned immediately into a touchdown. Again, he's going to give you opportunities, and if Sedarius Smith and of course the rest, you know, of the of the Minnesota pass rush. Um, you know, can generate enough heat against, again, an inconsistent offensive line. I think where that, I think that's where this game is probably going to be won for the Minnesota Vikings, at least defense versus offense. And obviously, again, uh, just real quickly, uh, and we'll expand upon this. I mean, listen, if Justin Jefferson gets going and he's more than capable, as you know, uh, that could be a long day at the office for the Washington Commanders because their cornerbacks stink. That was going to be my question. So I, I had the same two answers, and then I have one that's the other way that I think is interesting. But 
the, the Vikings did a really good job against Arizona of getting mm-hmm. Zadarius Smith one-on-one with a backup center. Mm-hmm. It's another backup center. So I, I wonder if they can just sort of copy paste some of that game plan and, and get mm-hmm. those one-on-ones at Arius Smith on Tyler Larson with no help. That's what the Vikings are going to want to do. And that's what Tyler Larson and Scott Turner and everybody are going to want to prevent. Yep. Vikings won that battle schematically last time. And if they can win it again, yeah, they can make it a long day. Um, I also wanted to ask you, look, Terry McLaurin can move the ball and the Vikings just gave up 159 yards to DeAndre Hopkins, basically by getting DeAndre Hopkins one-on-one with Cameron Dantzler, who has been a fine corner. He's been, he's been okay, but he is not going to hang with DeAndre Hopkins. And I don't think he can hang with Terry McLaurin either. Um, so has getting one-on-ones with Terry McLaurin also one-on-one with the slot corner, Chandon Sullivan, who's been a mighty struggle this year. Mm -hmm. Has that been the way that the commanders have wanted to get Terry McLaurin going? Well, to be honest with you, before last Sunday, they really hadn't found a way to consistently get Terry going in in any sort of capacity, uh, it, with the except with limited exception. Um, last week, one way they got him going was lining him up in the slot in a three by one formation to the right of Taylor Heineke, and mm-hmm. he ran basically a quick stop route. And then realized and broke off his route and realized his quarterback was drifting away from him and to the other side of the formation. And he just took off and broke away from the defender and ripped off a 42-yard catch and run. So one way that they could exploit the Minnesota Vikings, like you were just talking about, not only Dantzler, but also out of the slot where he can operate you know, again, as a traditional slot, he can operate out of a three by one or a two by two and be closer, you know, to the bunch at the line of scrimmage. So they can operate in a a number of different ways. And it doesn't look like they're going to have Jahan Dotson uh, for fifth consecutive game, their first round rookie out of Penn State. Uh, It's a possibility, but I would say probably not, uh, at least at this juncture. Um, but they still have Curtis Samuel. They got Logan Thomas back their tight end. Who's still, you know, dealing with a a bunch of injuries. They are going to, um, they are going to take their shots with Terry McLaurin because that's the best playmaker that they have. Just like any other team with a great receiver, again, Justin Jefferson, so on and so forth. So I do worry about that from a Minnesota perspective, but I would also say this, that if Minnesota can, again, make the Washington offense one-dimensional and take away the run and, mm-hmm. and limit the run or control the run, um, you know, then it's going to make it easier for them to kind of shade, cloud, cover, what have you. Yeah. McLaurin, the only other thing you would really have to watch out for is Antonio Gibson out of the backfield or lined up as a receiver as a receiver because he has been emerging more and more and more in that role. Okay. And that's interesting because the the Vikings, the biggest problem in Viking on the Vikings defense has been communication. Mm-hmm. And those scramble drills test your communication. Yeah. Depending on the situation, I mean, if you're in a, a man-to-man coverage, then you're just kind of chasing the guy around. And that's got its own challenges, but it's different. But in a zone structure, a zone match structure, even late in the play, you can pass a guy off and you've got to be good at that. And and Mm -hmm. can Taylor Heineke find those windows? That might be the avenue if the commanders are going to win this game is taking advantage of that. But what I'll say is that the Vikings have gotten a lot better at that in the last couple games, especially coming out of the bye. They were very good at it against Arizona so that and they like that the coverage was really good against Arizona except for the one-on-ones to DeAndre Hopkins was kind of the only pitch the Cardinals had and it wasn't enough um that that I might be a really important thing but I do want to talk a little bit about this Justin Jefferson matchup because every team has taken like the 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 league has sort of figured out their preferred strategy against Justin Jefferson Mm -hmm. let's get a safety on top of him Make sure he is doubled all the time. Call your coverages that say this will be toward 18. 18 is in the play call. And the, the safety's on top of him no matter what. And some teams have even used the other safety to, to be on the other side of the ball, to poach if he has a crosser across the field. Um, just using as many resources as they can. Very few teams have just said, all right, you go cover Justin Jefferson. And the only team that really did that was the Saints with Marshawn Lattimore, and it didn't work. Jefferson got a a go ball at the end of the game that Mm -hmm. ended up being like the key play. Even the the Eagles with Darius Slay, Darius Slay had help over the top sometimes. The Lions did really well against him with help over the top. Nobody else has really been able to stymie him that way. So do the commanders have the corners that are capable of 
taking Justin Jefferson out of this game? And are they going to be willing to commit as hard to stopping Justin Jefferson and leaving everybody else one-on-one TJ Hawkinson one-on-one now that he's part of the team, KJ Osborne, Adam Thielen, all are going to be one-on-one. Do they have the guys that can pull all that off? Uh, The answer to that, in my opinion, is no. But the only guy that's potentially able to do that, again, in my analysis, would be second-year corner Benjamin St. Juice, who Vikings fans might know and remember playing at the University of Minnesota, right? Now, uh, BSJ, as we call him, struggled a little bit last week, but that's the first time that he's really struggled since being inserted in the starting lineup week three against Philadelphia right after Philadelphia beat the Minnesota Vikings on Monday night football. Um, So I think you can take, you know, maybe they'll have some success like the Colts sort of did uh, last week against Benjamin St. Juice. But I know that Justin Jefferson against Kendall Fuller is probably a big time matchup advantage for the Minnesota Vikings. Yet, like you said, you know, it's kind of like pick your poison. I I mean, I I know Thielen was a little bit banged up, but, you know, if if assuming he plays, uh, KJ Osborne, looks TJ like Hawkinson. He's limited, but I think he's going to go. Or maybe right. TJ Hawkinson. I, I I assume he'll have maybe a red zone role. I I don't know how you. He'll feel have a about package. That. I bet. Yeah, he'll he'll um, get in so somewhere. I think the Commanders are not going to be able to totally focus on Jefferson because if you totally focus on Jefferson, obviously you get beat by the other guys or more specifically Dalvin Cook, right? Uh, as both a runner and, and and as I guess a receiver. But to me, I think the one they they play mostly zone as most teams do, and like you said, a lot of match coverage. I, I think um, I I don't think you'll see again Benjamin St. Juice march all around the field with uh, Justin Jefferson. So when he when you get Jefferson matched up against Kendall Fuller, I think that's the best opportunity for Kirk Cousins and the Minnesota Vikings to have success. Um, one other thing that you got to watch out for a little bit is a guy named Cameron Curl. Uh, a former seventh round pick. He's not explosive in terms of speed, Luke, but he is always around the ball. He's a, mm. a, a very smart, high IQ player. So maybe cool. they'll be able to shade some coverage that way. But a lot of times they use him to kind of help and run support and to attack the line of scrimmage in a three safety look, what they call their Buffalo nickel, where instead of playing three corners, mm-hmm. they'll play three safeties and two corners. So again, we could play the X's and O's crossover matchup all, all day long. Uh, ultimately it's going to be, Hey, don't get killed by Justin Jefferson. Maybe give him something, but don't get killed by him. He'll, he'll get his. Yeah. But you just have yeah. to keep that contained and hope right. that the, the commanders can win a game that comes down to something else. Um, I've got the bet online line and uh, the spread here, which we'll get to in a second. We'll start doing our predictions here. But first, a word about bet online. It's your one stop shop for all things sports betting. Not only football, you can bet on the spreads, you can do player props, you can bet even right in the middle of a game. But basketball, hockey, baseball, all in season, go bet on the World Series, all of that stuff you can find on bet online, even golf, tennis, MMA, whatever. Uh, you can go to betonline.net where the game starts. So, three and a half point spread, over under is 43 and a half. The implication there is that the betters think that this will be, call it 23 20, 24 21, maybe Vikings. Um, Vikings favored by three and a half on the road. What do you think? Is that, are they on or is that too low, too high, too much of one team? So our listeners uh, kind of get a little giddy when I pick the Washington Commanders to win because I think I'm three and zero when picking them to win this year. Uh-oh. Uh oh. However, um, you know if I if you're injecting me with truth serum and and you know I try and tell <laughs> the truth, right? I have to tell it how I feel. I just don't think the commander's offense is good enough to put up mid twenties. So I see them being in that 17 to 20 point range Mm -hmm. and shy of a, like a pick six or fumble return or or something freaky, a a long kickoff return that sets up a touchdown or maybe goes for a touchdown from an Antonio Gibson. I just don't see the commander's scoring enough points to keep up with Kirk and the Minnesota Vikings and their array of weapons. So to me, I see the Minnesota Vikings winning this game. I see the Minnesota Vikings winning this game probably between four and seven points. Uh, okay. And I think we'll I think we'll go over the bet online total uh, if I had to guess. I, I think I'm with you on all re- of that. That seems reasonable, right? 
yeah, I think I'm with you on all of that. Uh, the Vikings have not yet shown me that they are capable of winning a game by more than one score. So mm-hmm. I would have to assume that this once again will be a one score game and that the final minutes of the game will be relevant to it. Um, I would love to see the Vikings just put someone away, but I haven't seen it so far. The over under for Washington is 20 and a half uh, points scored on bet online. I, I do. I like that under, I think, too, because as much as I like Heineke's improvisational thing and as as much as Terry McLaurin kind of scares me with the the holes in the Vikings secondary, they've been they played a little better recently. And that is a couple of things that are scary, but it, it does not an offense make. Um, and I think you need something more complete. And I don't I, from what you have told me, it doesn't sound like the commanders have it. So I like that Washington under as well. But I, I also like, in total, the over because I think the Vikings can score. And if, the, if I think the Vikings can score and I don't think the Commanders can, I think I got to pick the Vikings to cover, right. Right? right? Call me a homer, but that, that's the way that it feels to me. But I guess let, let's flip this around. It's Monday. The Commanders won. What's the story of that game? What, is, what, are, what are the headlines in that situation? So the way, I, I again, I see them winning is if they can create enough takeaways okay. to alter the, you know, the, the talent disparity, in my opinion, the commanders are, are number two in the NFL uh, on third down defense, right? They, they are really good on third down. They might, might emphasis might get chase young back on a very limited package for the first time in almost a year. Uh, again, that mm-hmm. is not definite. That is a might. Um, And if they can force third and longs, if they can get off the field like they have done a really good job of this year, uh, and if they could somehow create a turnover or two, they've lived off of turnovers during this three games uh, winning streak that they had at Chicago. They let up almost 400 yards to Fields and the Bears pedestrian offense, uh, yet they forced three takeaways turnover on downs or takeaways inside the five yard line. And then last week they forced two takeaways, including both right around the red zone area. So taking and, and had a goal line stand as well. So, or I'm sorry, not a goal line, not a true goal line stand, but a, 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 uh, a stand where they were at the one yard line with first down and they forced a field goal out of it. So again, they've done a really good job in that area. So if the Washington Mm -hmm. commanders are going to win, I think that's really the only legitimate way that they do it. Unless there's a special teams freaky type situation uh, that again, probably we can't count for. Uh, But I would also tell you this. I know, you know, Joseph drives you guys crazy from time to time. Joey (laughs) Sly, the Washington uh, place yeah. kicker is somebody that I have a hard time trusting. He's missed too many kicks uh, in preseason and the regular season and all off season, Luke, for me to feel confident about the commanders in that area. Yeah, Vikings fans will basically never want a game to come down to a kick ever in their lives. <laughs> and that's fair. So two things on that, that I think are kind of doom that scenario. But if that like takeaways can always happen, right? You can just get a Kirk Cousins just totally screws up and throws four sure. picks and like that that can happen, right? But the Vikings right now have scored on 18 of their 27 red zone trips. Mm-hmm. 66.7, two thirds of the time. That's fifth best in the league in their red zone. Um, their red zone offense has been fantastic. A lot of that has been Kevin O'Connell scheming up freebies on the goal line. A lot of those touchdowns have been nobody really had to execute very much because the the play call was just so... The, the motion was so good and it was so genius that it was a walk-in. Um, I would imagine he's not out of tricks by week nine. <laughs> so that, I, I feel like the red zone offense is one of the strengths of the Vikings. Um, and the other thing is the special teams for the Vikings has, it's one of the like unsustainable things that make people not believe in the Vikings. They're good for like a punt fumble a game right now. <laughs> and the mm-hmm. returns have been good. They're, they're in the top of the league in like field position metrics. Um, basically everything, but the kicking has been fantastic. Matt Daniels is kind of the special teams coordinator is kind of a a breakout superstar. Um, and then also one matchup that'll be interesting if chase young gets a lot of run will be chase young versus Christian Derrissaw. Christian Derrissaw is our left tackle. He's been having a breakout. I genuinely think he should be an all pro. Um, he is having a breakout season. It's, he's just stealing souls. 
Chase Young would be a really interesting matchup. I, I would just point out that if Chase Young plays, he's going to play a very, very, very limited role in this okay. game. And and also, I, I, if you if you don't mind, I, I want to give a shout out to my guy Ben Kotwika, who's part of the of Matt Daniels' coaching. You know, uh, he's I think the his official oh, title is yeah. assistant specialty. He's a terrific coach. I, I worked with him. Uh, we, we, you know, we talk uh, you know on a regular basis. He's such a good man and a good coach. So I think he's helped them out. Uh, in that regard uh, a- as well. So that's, you know, I- I'm really happy, um, you know, to see some of the success that you guys have had uh, in-, in in that regard. And I, I think this, um, you know, I think this Vikings team is for real. I picked them to win the division before the year. And so far, nothing All has right. really surprised me. And I think the best is still yet to come. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing them in person on Sunday. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I sure hope that all of your predictions come true. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, Commanders fans, thank you for for listening. You can find me at Luke Brown NFL, Locked On Vikings. Um, Vikings fans, you can find Locked On Commanders wherever you listen to Locked On Vikings. And of course, vice versa on all of that. For Chris Russell, I'm Luke Braun. Uh, this has been Crossover Thursday. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you tomorrow.